Welcome to the Pasqua Sports. I'm Dave the Pasqua, your host. Joining me later is my brother Sam. For the Philadelphia sports fans, nothing ever seems to go their way. With the Eagles, Sixers, Flyers, and Phillies spiraling out of control, fans have had it. The city of brotherly love wears their emotions on their sleeves when it comes to their Philadelphia sports. Negativity has consumed the city of brotherly love due to the team's lackluster performance at best. But Sam, let's be honest, they both really suck. These are professional athletes who are paid millions of dollars, and this is the crap that fans have to watch. Well, I've been watching Philadelphia sports since I was young, and we are still terrible. (laughs) One championship in the past 32 years from all four Philadelphia sports teams. Where's the time going? We still can't win. I mean, in 08, we saw the Phillies win the World Series, but other than that, I mean, nothing's really transpired. Even former Pennsylvania Governor Ed Randell put a bag over his head after the last Eagles game to voice his displeasure. He said he was voicing the fans, and that is completely right because there's been a bag over everyone's head in Philadelphia. Well, from the intentional tanking to whatever Chip Kelly's doing in with the Eagles, we just can't seem to win. (laughs) And that's right. They can't seem to win, exactly, especially in this month. It's a tragedy to watch these professional teams in this town because, let's be honest, they don't play like professionals, not even collegiate at some times. It looks like a high school JV squad. So for first, we're going to talk about our beloved Philadelphia Eagles, who are 4-6, and complete nosedive this season. In preseason, the squad looked like Super Bowl contenders. They were throwing the ball down the field. They were scoring big. Now people are calling for Chip Kelly's head as he's the general manager, head coach, play caller. But let's be honest, NFC least, as people call it, is one of the worst divisions of football. And the Eagles look like complete and utter crap, too. Well, in their defense, that NFC least is so bad that they could still win if they ever (laughs) decided to put some effort in there. Go get the game. And that's exactly right. Effort. They don't have any effort, and that's what's going on. I mean, we're going to tackle the issues on the Eagles, especially because the Eagles' defense seems they don't want to do it at all, allowing Doug Martin of Tampa Bay to run for 235 yards, too shy of the record held by the franchise, Emmett Smith. I mean... It was a complete and utter embarrassment on Sunday. My other brother went to the game. He said half the crowd left at halftime. The final was 45-17. Are you kidding me? I mean, no words. It's just, it's, it's pathetic at this point. I think the Eagles defense just got tired of the offense being so bad that they can't <laughs> carry the game anymore. I mean, to go, in his defense, I mean, I can't even defend anyone on this defense after that. Five touchdowns to a rookie quarterback. Jameis Winston... Five touchdowns. Are you kidding me? Maxwell makes $63 million. He looked like he didn't want to be there. Nolan Carroll looked like toast on half the plays. Kiko Alonso was on the ground for three of the runs that went for 50 yards. I mean, I don't know what they're even doing on defense after last night. Well, there's been no pass rush whatsoever for the whole season. How are you supposed to get into the quarterback's head if you can't hit him? (laughs) You got Brandon Graham who's there. I mean, you got Connor Barwin. The ball hit his hands. I mean, my little brother can catch the ball that hit his hands for crying out loud. He drops it, and then Tampa scores again. Well, that's one of the reasons they're on defense. They can't seem to catch the ball. Well, that's a good point, but one of the players that actually could catch the ball was LaShawn McCoy. Will you explain to me why in the world the Eagles traded a player that can make men mess in the backfield, is very elusive, and get to the edge, and we decide to trade the up-tempo back to Buffalo, for a linebacker that apparently doesn't have any ACLs, and then you sign DeMarco Murray, who doesn't even fit the scheme. Well, Chip was hoping for a north and south running back after getting rid of LaShawn McCoy, and Kiko Alonso was supposed to fill the gap in the middle inside linebacker because we were having depth issues. But it turns out that Kiko Alonso was just hurt all the time, and at the same time, DeMarco Murray tried to turn his running style into LaShawn McCoy, and it turns out he's not LaShawn McCoy. But don't you think that's part of play calling? I mean, you're getting all these sweeps and jets to the outside, and they're not running north and south. Well, the part of the, the sweep is he's supposed to run sideways until he sees the hole and cut up field and just start running straight. But there's been no hole to run up. 
There's no offensive line to talk about. Absolutely. The offensive line has been atrocious. You got guys like Alan Barbary, Matt Tobin. I mean, they couldn't start for Penn State at this point because they went against Ndamuk and Sue and Gerald McCoy last two weeks. Granted, they're top five defensive linemen in the league, but you have one-on-one matchups, and they're in the backfield sitting on Sam Bradford and Mark Sanchez in less than two seconds. You can't have that. Their pathetic performance up front impacts everyone else. I mean, Jason Kelsey, I don't know what the hell happened to him. He has snaps going over the quarterback's head. He's getting burnt up front. And then on addition to it, you got Lane Johnson calling out Philadelphia fans saying they're not good enough. They should back us. They just gave up. And then you got Jason Peters, who's a future Hall of Famer, and he's hurt. So, I mean, I couldn't stand what Lane Johnson said. It all starts up front. The games that the Eagles offensive line played well in were wins. All the other games, they've been manhandled by the defense and our offense has seemingly gone nowhere. But Chip Kelly's okay letting go of pro bowler Evan Mathis to begin the season. They, don't, they didn't need a pro ball guard at all. Well, it starts with continuity up front and we have none. So how are they supposed to develop the, con- the chemistry without having to be in- able to play together and then... Peters goes down, Johnson's playing hurt, Kelsey has to adjust to the two new guards next to him, knowing that all the A-gap pressure is coming, and he has to snap the ball real quick, and then has to see all these guys coming right at him. And don't even get me started on the receiving core, Riley Cooper, man, what a boy, I just can't even imagine how great he's been. Miles Austin just seems lost, the Dolphins game goes right through his hands, and that seals the deal for the Eagles' loss. I just can't understand. You let go of players like Deshaun Jackson. Jeremy Macklin gets overplayed. I understand that he goes to Kansas City. But you got to do something. Nelson Aguilar's been MIA. All these guys are trying to learn the offense real fast in this up-tempo scheme, but they seem to not be catching on, or they're just not good enough to get open in this man-to-man pressure. So it's one of the two things. It's either Chip Kelly's system, or these receivers just aren't good enough. Eagles have a 4-6 and six record. Now, Sam, we're going to run through the rest of the regular season. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving. They play against the Lions. Do you like their odds? I like their odds against the Lions, but again, we're playing in Detroit, so it could be a tough game. That is going to be a tough game. Final set, do they win or not on Thanksgiving? They're 6-0. and oh. I see a win. Last year, we destroyed the Cowboys on Thanksgiving. Hopefully, Chip Kelly can get it turned around again. The following week, they go to New England. I can't imagine Tom Brady not putting up 500 passing yards. It depends on the defensive line. If we can get pressure on Tom Brady, they have a lot of backup linemen. The Bills shut down their offense, and Danny Amendola just left the game again with a knee injury, so their receiving core has been depleted. So, granted, all right, so the Eagles, that's probably 5-7, and seven, probably 1-1 one yes, one most yes. likely, well, hoping. Hoping. One one. There's a long shot in the one and the other one they have. And then the return of LaShawn McCoy against the Bills. I believe the Eagles will be very hyped to play you Shady would, coming back to town. You would think they would be hyped. I'm hoping that to win. So that pushes them to 6-7. and seven. But after that, you, you have two straight home games. That's pretty much the season. You got the Cardinals, and then the following Saturday, you have the Redskins. That could determine your season, because 8-8 eight eight might win the NFC least. I believe 8-8 eight eight does win the NFC least right now, and if they can win those two division games, that will give them the edge in the division with four division wins, and at the end of the year, that could come into a big play. What about the Giants? Do you think the Giants or the Skins game at the end of the season is more important? Both of them are going to be of the utmost importance because the Giants, we automatically have the tiebreaker if we win that game. But if we lose to the Skins right there, that could be, like last year, the ending blow to our season. Certainly could be. I'm predicting 79. We'll see how far that can get down the road. Now, Sam, our analytic man, you know all about the Sixers. You're very passionate about the Sixers. The Sixers roster, let's be honest, they're filled with a bunch of misfits, other than Jaleel Okafor and New Orleans Noel. In the last couple minutes against the Timberwolves, they decided not to give ball to their best player. They blow the game, lose by five. Okafor finishes with 25 points and 12 rebounds. He's by far the best rookie so far this season. What in the world is going on? He abused Carl Anthony Towns in the paint. 
Well, I believe that was more of the system. Brett Brown wants to run a running gun offense so that by the time they got down, Jaleel's a little slower getting down the court. So by the time he got down the court, Jeremy Grant was already set up in the post wanting the ball. But then I believe this all falls onto Sam Hinkie's plan. And you can see the frustration <laughs> start to build with Brett Brown as the coach. He knows that Jaleel Okafor is the primary target now, but he also believes that a 19-year-old should not be the face of your offense, the face of your franchise. We've had three years of this, and right now we have two NBA players that you can for sure say they have a role or they're going to be in the league for a while. But it comes down to the plan because you can't tell role players from these second-round picks and these undrafted players. In order to tell a role player, you need them to fill a role. A 30 minutes a game causes inflated statistics. It causes everything that Sam Hickey stands for but you can't to crumble. You can't inflate the record. They have an 0-15 record. They don't even have an NBA guard on this roster. To your point, you want to know the stats? Sam Hickey in his three years here has 37 wins, 142 losses. Again, those stats are even more inflated if you consider the five and... I believe they ran, won around five games to begin Brett Brown's first season as head coach right at the beginning of the season with Evan Turner and Spencer Hawes and all those players that we continued to dump for more draft picks in the second round to try to identify these so-called role players that have no roles to fill. It's so true. They have such a, a band of misfits. It's ridiculous seeing these D-leaguers on the roster with the third lowest attendance in the NBA. Fans are fed up. They don't want to see this team play. I felt awful for, for Okafor. Additionally, critics think they could probably lose to some college teams. There was competition last year where Kentucky just looked a thousand times better than the Sixers. Well, in the Sixers' defense, a college team isn't to be compared to an NBA team, just for the fact they're kids, different shot clock, they're just running up and down. They can't, it's, it's, the Sixers are deprived of the talent of Kentucky, but at the same time, they have these top draft picks that would be top players at Kentucky, but two or three years in the future in advancement of their game. But think about it. Noel could still be at Kentucky right now. He could still be in college. Same with N Okafor. They could still be at college, but you saw what those two did to the coll collegiate game before mm -hmm. Noel's ACL tear and then Okafor last year, runner-up as Naismith Player of the Year, and then a national championship at Duke. Sam Henke has gone in full tank mode. That's quite obvious. Hoping with the NBA draft only 218 days and counting. It can't come soon enough, but it's also sad to think that this team has the most potential to win. Are you kidding me? Between the Eagles, the Flyers, the Phillies, the Sixers haven't won a game yet, but they're most likely on their way to the championship. Well, when Sam Hickey was hired, the plan was to win, be contending for the championship in 2017 and 2018. So if you take that into consideration... <laughs> I don't know where Chip Kelly's going with this team, and the Phillies haven't done anything. I'm not much of a Flyers person, so I can't speak on their behalf, but the Sixers, after acquiring four potential first-round picks this year, and the entire second round, it seems, with Sarich and Embiid possibly coming off injury and coming back from Europe, the Sixers could make a run in a couple years if these players develop, but then again... The losing culture that's being developed could stunt their growth. With that growth, though, people are all in. We saw it with Andrew Wiggins, winless for Wiggins here in Philadelphia. They are all in on Ben Simmons, the 6'10 freshman who's receiving comparisons to the likes of LeBron James and Magic Johnson. His athletic ability is off the charts. A couple nights ago, he put up 21 points, 20 rebounds, and dished out 7 assists. I mean, they're in tanking mode, but hey, if you can land a player like him and Okafor, they can do damage in the league. In addition, last night he had 14 rebounds and 10 assists, and to go along with that, zero turnovers. The first player since Ben Gordon, University of Connecticut, to be able to put up numbers like that. And it's been 20 plus years that a player of 6'10 or taller to be able to do something of that caliber. <laughs> 
It's just crazy to think about if you could just land a player like that can completely change a franchise. You got the franchise center, you get the guard. The Sixers are in business, but I mean, a couple games ago, the Sixers had 31 turnovers in one game. It's just hard to believe Coach Brown can just continue to wait like this. You could see the frustration at the end of last year. He was calling out Sam Hickey saying that he can't continue to coach a band of gypsies because they have <laughs> these D-League players that keep on coming and going. 10-day contracts, undrafted players, D-leaguers. Eventually, they need talent on this team in order to win. You can't but hope that eventually they'll turn it around and every time they just break your heart, it seems. Talking about breaking your heart. In 2008, the Phillies won the World Series. Fast forward seven years, the Phillies are eh mediocre. No, that's being too nice. They're pathetic. Let's let's go. Let's, let's stick with the word pathetic. The Phillies had more employees, most likely, ten baseball games than actual fans last season. Oh, I I was only able to get around to one or two games last season, and it was tough to watch. <laughs> it, was, it was the entire upper deck was empty. The aging roster had problems. The stars as Cole Hamels was dealt for prospects because you're desperate. You got aging guys like Chase Utley, who was a fan favorite. He would have put fans in the stands, but, I mean, by the time, his knees are gone. And then you got other guys who are just Ryan Howard, who's just sitting there making $20 million and can barely hit a baseball. Well, it all comes down to the general manager a few years ago. Everybody could see this roster aging, and we were going nowhere, but he wanted to hold on to these players, hold on to the dream that the window was still alive. Are you kidding me? He was chasing a false dream there. And the parting gift, who was the former general manager, Ruben Amaro Jr., also nicknamed as Ruin Tomorrow Jr., is that he left them with the number one overall pick in the MLB draft for the worst record in baseball. Well, the new guy coming in, his name is Matt Clintack. He's from the Angels. He's a young guy. He brings a lot of energy. Shane Victorino really upped him up to the Philadelphia media, saying this guy can do a lot of things. And one of the first things he's looking to do is possibly trade their young closer, Ken Giles. It depends what you can get for the young closer, because right now we're so far away from winning that the illusion of winning right away might not be there. So by the time we have a roster built around this young closer, he might already be out of his prime. The kid can hit triple digits on the radar gun. His value is sky high. He's 25 years old, has a 1.56 ERA, only in 113 games. Houston appears to be the front runner to land his services because they want another chance to run at the World Series. It seems like a match made in heaven. They have a lot of young guys on that roster, but it depends what they're willing to give up for him. Well, Houston has a lot of prospects from those years of being one of the worst teams in baseball. They were able to replete their farm system, and now that they have all these prospects, they might be willing to deal some, and then we may be able to start building our farm system back up after all those years of trading our own prospects. Exactly. Stockpiling the farm makes the most sense. This opportunity might not come around again because the Padres just dealt their all-star closer, Craig Kimbrell, for four top prospects to the Boston organization. The Phillies might see that and go, this is our chance. Let's see what happens. You also have to hope the Phillies don't ask for too high, because if you do, you can really get on the general manager's nerves, and then a no deal ever comes through that way. That's true. Thank you, Sam, for joining me. We're talking Philadelphia sports. Hold your heads up, Philadelphia fans. Maybe they'll be good when you're old and gray.